Ebusiya for mama kwa ba ede mwa ba version media GH so na ene eba be pium o the Wisconsin International University College e wo enkra manto mu haya na the former president and the current presidential candidate are all standing for um ndc ababe pm wa ha chese one the students uh, and the staff of wisconsin international university ababe din komo na one ne uh, running mate eh professor jenana okoku ajimai and eh, some top npp and eh, sorry some top ndc big wigs yes ena ma ababe pm wa ha na o hwe video no dia e twa go sisi ano ye wa bra eh ni ba sharaf uh, Mahama Era Auditorium Ho Na Enye Asem Ketua Kra Eti no Ibu Siya For Stick and Stay On This Channel For Interesting Updates Yadi Bremo From The Camp Of uh, John Mahama Wabra Ostome Wisconsin International University College Yes, it's true. I was in a, a member of a political study cell uh, in the university where young radical students. And um, because as a young person, I was born into a CPP family and I obviously had a left of center orientation. And so these were little political cells that uh, made us study politics and socialism. And then um, again I encountered Prof. In a very interesting way, he was lecturing at the School of Communication Studies and I had applied to be a student. And I was in Tamale at the time, I write about it in my book. I tried to get a flight that day to come back to Accra because the interview was the next day. Unfortunately, there were no flights like you have today, just by a ticket and fly. You had to go to the Air Force Station and get some connection with a soldier to put you on the flight. Unfortunately, my connection didn't work, so the flights went and left me. It was the only flight. State transport had also taken off. You couldn't get tickets. They sell tickets to four people in the line. They say the ticket is finished. The rest of the tickets are sold under the table. We've come a long way in Ghana. And so I had to go to the barrier and pay a little something to the policeman to find me a vehicle going to Accra. And the only vehicle I got was one loaded with maize. And so we all had to go and sit on top of the maize. And uh, they brought us all the way to Kitapo. From Kitapo, I got a bus that brought me to Kumasi. And then a uh, state transport driver that I knew. I explained to him my predicament. There was no seat, but he made me sit on the steps when you're climbing to the bus. So I start in the corner there on the stairs. And I got to Accra. Late in the interviews had started, my name had been called. And Prof was on the interview panel. And so I got there a bit dusty, looking quite ragged. I managed to clean my face. And uh, he, he said, oh, you've been called already. My heart just dropped. It was like, oh, there goes the opportunity. He said, OK, you go and sit down. Who well, attend to everybody, one will finish, will call you. And so I went and sat outside, very forlornly. And uh, eventually they called me. He was part of the panel that interviewed me. And um, I must admit, after the interview, they said, you go home, you get a letter from us. And so I knew in my heart that I had been taken. And um, of course, when I came to the school, he was my teacher in journalism. And he made me learn how to type. Because Prof made a rule that any homework he gave you or any exercise he gave you, he will not accept an unwritten uh, uh, work. And so you have to go and type. In those days, there were computers were in their infancy, so you have to go and get an actual typewriter and learn to type. You know, and so I know how to type because uh, Professor Karikari made me type, and uh, he's contributed to making me. Journalism was one of my favorite subjects, and because of that, afterwards I did my 
uh, internship in the uh, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, and then also taught part time in the Ghana Institute of Journalism. And uh, my flair for writing has come from what I learned um, in the School of Communication Studies. But let me thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to get over with the boring part. Um, I was asked to give a talk on our policy on education and how it links with job creation. And so I'm going to get rid of the boring part. I think after that there will be an interactive session and we'll be able to flesh out the issues more. So I'll read this uh, prepared text and then um, after that we can have the opportunity to talk some more. I want to thank you for granting me the opportunity to deliver the maiden public lecture in your planned series of lectures organized by the School of Communication Studies of the Wisconsin University for flag bearers standing in the 2024 general elections. I'm particularly grateful to the management of Wisconsin International University College and the Acting Dean School of Communication Studies of the college for offering me the platform to share perspectives of my vision on the youth within the context of education and job creation. This program is being held at a time of great national distress and economic crisis. Our economy is in tatters and on the verge of collapse. It has been mismanaged into unprecedented crises which have afflicted all of us with unbearable suffering and pain. The features of our economy in the last few years under this administration has been an astronomical public debt which we are unable to pay, humiliating debt defaults, embarrassing credit rating downgrades, hyperinflation, a collapsed currency, widening budget deficits, and very painful cost of living crisis. Over 1.3 million of our compatriots, including pensioners, have had to endure extremely painful appropriation of their interest and principal payments under the so-called domestic debt exchange. This is a crisis which could have been entirely avoided if the caution of the opposition and civil society had been heeded in a timely manner. The extremely harsh effect of the economic mismanagement can be seen all round as it has ravaged almost every sector of our country and the education sector is one of the hardest hit. At the last reckoning, there were over 5,400 schools that exist under trees and in dilapidated structures at the basic level. Research by a coalition of civil society groups in the education sector shows that only 17 out of this number I just mentioned have been replaced since this government announced a program to do so in 2021. You should contrast this with the fact that between 2010 and 2016, the NDC government awarded a total of 2,936 schools under three projects, out of which 2,031 were completed by the time we left office. As we speak, as many as 2.3 million pupils at the basic level do not have desks and must either sit on the bare floor or on cement blocks or on their stomachs during studies. This number represents 40% of the total number of children in basic schools. Over 1.2 million children of school going age between four and 17 years are not in school. Out of this number, almost 1 million of them, to be precise, 942,427 children are reported to have never attended school. And this is in the Population and Housing Census of 2021. So these are facts I'm reading out to you. For four straight years, textbooks have not been supplied to schools and one can only wonder how teachers and students alike are coping. And this is after a change in curriculum. Textbooks have not been made available. For six consecutive terms, capitation grants have not been released to schools. It is important to stress that it is through these capitation grants 
that basic inputs at the primary level, like uh, uh, writing boards, etc., are provided. Attendance registers, among others, it is through these capitation grants that they are procured for the running of the schools. We are all familiar with the numerous demonstrations and strike actions, some of which are currently ongoing and backed on by school feeding caterers over non-payment of monies due to them. In the last few months, suppliers of food for the Buffer Stock Company Limited, which in turn supplies senior high schools with food, have staged a sitting strike at the premises of the company to demand millions of Ghana CDs that is owed to them. And recently there was a teacher who was a headmaster who was explaining that they serve what is available. And so sometimes they have only rice. So rice water in the morning, rice in the afternoon, and mutu in the evening. And then when they have only maize, cocoa in the morning, uh, uh, bamboo in the afternoon, tozafi in the evening. In addition to these, the erratic academic calendar at the senior high school level, inadequate infrastructure, leading to overcrowding, insanitary conditions, intimidation and victimization of school heads and teachers and other stakeholders and misguided policy making are some of the problems that exist in our educational sector today. At the tertiary level, you are also too aware of the severe accommodation shortages on campus and the astronomical rents and fees that students have to pay to secure accommodation as close to their institutions as possible. This is due to underinvestment in facilities on the various campuses which Get Fund was designed to address. Non-payment of funds accruing to Get Fund and the collateralization of the fund by this government have hampered the investment that should otherwise have been made to address the problems I have just outlined. We believe that the ad hoc haphazard political motivated policy making and implementation and the short-sighted tinkering that have created these problems must give way to substantive thinking and offering that curate appropriate and visionary solutions to our educational challenges. My vision for the youth in respect of our education is to focus on their holistic development by balancing their intellect, which is their head, their character, which is their heart, and their skills, which is their hands. So it's heart, head, heart, and hands. The three H's. To this end, I will facilitate an educational system that does, that does not only expand access to education, it's not only about access. So we'll facilitate a system that does not only expand access to education, but more importantly, that it indexes access expansion to quality and equity. And therefore, access, quality, and equity are the three key pillars that will drive our vision in education. In pursuit of this vision, my administration will promote and prioritize investment in education, but particularly at the education, at the basic education level. I commit myself to strengthening basic level education because if the preschool and primary level of education that provide foundational learning opportunities are weak, performance at the secondary level will continue to be a challenge. The next SDC government will invest heavily in the construction and renovation of schools with particular focus on underserved and rural areas. We'll continue our program to remove schools under trees and provide furniture for children at the basic level. With regards to the free, the e blogs in our effort to expand access to education, we will revisit the initiative of Community Day Senior High Schools, which were popularly called the e block These schools 
have been abandoned without any justifiable reason by the current administration. We're going to build more e-blocks, community day schools, in high urban population areas. And I'm talking about this. What I've said is, in some of the high urban population areas where land is difficult to find, we're going to take existing secondary schools because they have extra land and we'll put a second secondary school on the same land so that we can expand the number of children. With the e-blocks or the community day schools that we have built in rural areas that have a wide catchment area, we will provide dormitory blocks so that children who come from outside the community where the school is will have a place to stay while they are. With the much publicized pro problem militating against the free and uh, successful implementation of the free SHS program, we intend to tackle them head on. And as I've said earlier, within 100 days of my being sworn into office, the next NDC government will hold a stakeholder consultative engagement to discuss the challenges facing our educational sector with special focus on improving implementation of the free SHS policy. So this stakeholder engagement will discuss basic, secondary and tertiary, but with emphasis on improving the implementation of free uh, secondary education. Through this stakeholder dialogue, we will collectively devise strategies and solutions to further halt the decline and improve the free SHS program. We are committed to abolishing the double track system as soon as possible. Mr. Chairman, between 2012 and 2016, my administration paid particular attention to technical and vocational education. When we regain power in 2024, we will revisit the initiatives that we commenced and will review the current trends and make TVET education more engaging and industry driven. Enhancing partnerships between TVET institutions and industries across various sectors will be a priority involvement of our industries in shaping TVET training curricula that align with their needs. With, with the needs of the job market. And this is what we're going to emphasize so that students should be more equipped with entrepreneurial and practical skills that fit the job market. With regards to STEM education, we're going to streamline STEM education, mainstream STEM education into our educational system. We don't believe in stand-alone STEM secondary schools like this administration is building. We believe that to get a holistic training, all-round training, even if you are studying the humanities, you need some science education and some mathematics and technical education. And so rather than build stand-alone STEM secondary schools, we're going to rehabilitate all the old science resource centers and create them into STEM centers. So that all the secondary schools can have access to STEM learning instead of a few privileged uh, secondary schools. In all the e-blocks that we built, the community-based schools, we put four laboratories. A laboratory for physics, for chemistry, biology, and general science. Those laboratories are going to be the STEM centers for the community-based schools. We're going to develop those laboratories in all the community-based schools as their STEM centers. With all the other secondary schools, the science resource centers will be available for them to use as their STEM centers. An NDC leadership will also enhance the quality and availability of online mode of distance learning as a way of diversifying the delivery of tertiary education in the country. These flexible learning options will grant more students 
access to tertiary education while fulfilling their other employment commitments. Additionally, as the economy improves, we have plans to establish six new public universities in the six new regions. One in each of the newly created regions. This is to ensure that tertiary educational opportunities are accessible across the country and bridge the gap between the newly created regions and the old established regions. We're also committed to providing scholarships and financial assistance through the scholarship scheme, scheme and this will not be on protocol basis to children of uh, favored political uh, uh, per, per exposed persons. We also intend to enhance the student loan scheme to provide proper sufficient loans to students to be able to finance their education and they are only enjoyed to pay back when they have been formally employed. This is going to be administered in collaboration with the banking and financial sectors. So students will be required to open accounts in a particular bank and the loan scheme will be channeled through their bank accounts. In our unwavering commitment to education, equity stands as a fundamental pillar of our vision. We recognize that achieving equitable access to quality education is essential for the holistic development and empowerment of every Ghanaian child. Equity and inclusiveness are therefore at the heart of our vision for education. Our focus will be on bridging the gap between the less endowed schools located in the rural and urban poor areas and the rich urban endowed schools. Our goal is to ensure that no child is left behind irrespective of their socioeconomic background, their geographical location, their gender or any other characteristic. And we started to achieve this when Nana Ajman was Minister of Education. We saw a change in the performance of secondary schools. Some rural schools that before had been performing very poorly suddenly jumped up to the top and there were many of them who came into the top 20 in terms of performance, you know, at the West African Examination Council exams. We're going to continue and bring, make that a fact of life again. Key in NDC's equity agenda is the promotion of gender equity at all levels of education. We commit ourselves to enforcing laws that empower girls and young people with special needs to facilitate their access to quality education. Now let me emphasize that the provision of holistic education must open opportunities for job creation. And that's why young people have been supported to develop the relevant knowledge, skills and attitudes through the skills the school system. The next question is how opportunities can be created for these educated youth to apply the skills and knowledge that they have acquired. And this makes the issue of job creation and employment a priority item on our next leadership agenda. A major challenge facing our young people is unemployment. As reported in the 2021 population and housing census, Ghana has a working age population of 19.9 million people. And out of this, 1.6 million are unemployed. While 7.7 .7 million find themselves in vulnerable work situations, it means they are underemployed. The general unemployment rate currently as announced by the Ghana Statistical Service, stands at 14.7%, an alarming increase from the 8.5% in 2016. And so it means that if you disaggregate the figures, 33% of young people aged 15 to 24 in our population do not have employment. And indeed, if you go to our homes, they are several of our younger brothers and sisters who finished school four to five years ago who still are at home because they cannot find employment. But the alarming statistic is also that the higher unemployment ratio is among those with a tertiary education. 
And so it means that you are punished for successfully achieving tertiary education because unemployment is lower amongst those who are secondary school holders and JHS and basic school holders than amongst uh, those with a tertiary education. To address these challenges, my administration was set up a separate ministry for youth development. This ministry is going to cut across all ministries because it is going to input policy for employment of young people in all the ministries from education to health to agriculture to industry to trade and every other ministry. And so this is a ministry which will pay attention to youth empowerment and employment and that's why we call it the ministry of and, and youth development. It's going to be separate from the sports ministry. The sports ministry is not going to have anything to do with it because we want 100% concentration on issues of young people. The key plan of our job creation strategy is the novel 24 hour economy, economy program. This program has caught the fancy of many young people across the country. This innovative program is designed to create a thriving economic environment that operates round the clock, fostering a multitude of opportunity, employment opportunities for young people. Under the 24 hour economic program, we'll focus on revitalizing existing and dormant industries. And so we're going to invest in bringing industries that have collapsed back on stream and existing industries that are not performing well, we're going to invest in them so that they can create more employment for young people. We will invest in fostering the growth of emerging sectors that have the potential to operate beyond traditional working hours. By extending the business hours and encouraging businesses to operate during evenings and at weekends, we aim to maximize productivity and create a diverse range of jobs that cater for the needs and aspirations of our youth. This initiative, I'm convinced, will not be smoothly implemented without the involvement of the private sector. My administration will therefore work closely with the private sector, which presently employs 90% of the workforce, according to the Ghana uh, uh, GSS 2021, including business entrepreneurs and investors. By fostering partnerships and providing incentives, we'll grant the private sector some tax reliefs to encourage them to embrace and operationalize the 24-hour economy policy. We will incentivize them to expand their operations and create new job opportunities. This collaborative effort with the private sector will not only stimulate economic growth, but also enable the youth to gain valuable employment experience and contribute to the nation's development. One other area I find critical in our job creation uh, policy is the agricultural and agribusiness sectors. As a farmer myself, I strongly identify agriculture as a major backbone to the Ghanaian economy. Agriculture in all its forms, from crops, crop farming, fishing, animal rearing, etc., continues to be an avenue for employment amongst the young people of our country. As part of our job creation strategy in the agricultural sector, we will strategically diversify the agricultural landscape and tap into new market opportunities. We intend to make agriculture sexy and cool. We're going to move away from the home and cutlass agriculture. We will create farmer service centers so young agricultural entrepreneurs who want to go into farming 
will receive all the services they need from the Family Service Centre. While they are receiving those services, we will teach them to use the equipment themselves. As I stand here, I can drive a tractor, I can plow my own field. And we will teach the young people to be able to do it. And we'll teach you all the agri extension uh, uh, knowledge that you need so that you can uh, 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 create a good income for yourself. Aside from that, we'll also introduce modern agricultural techniques. I'm sure those of you who've been to other countries, you notice that now a lot of produce is being done in greenhouse conditions. And when we're in office, if you go to Dawenia, we set up greenhouses there, the intention was to allocate it to young people who were interested in agriculture to produce vegetables, tomatoes, onions, carrots, and everything for the markets in Accra. Unfortunately, after we left, my understanding is the place has been abandoned. And so we're going to make agriculture sexy and cool so that young people will be interested in going to agriculture. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.